Thank you very much, Miguel, for the introduction. And thank you, Hugo, uh, for inviting us to, to present in this symposium, which but I had the opportunity of being here yesterday for a bit, and it, it all looks really, really interesting for everyone. So you mentioned that it's a challenging subject, creativity, and uh, I would agree with that. I mean, there's so much that has been written, you know, talked about creativity over, over many, many, many years. And it's funny that even reading and understanding or trying to understand a lot of that, actually the truth is that there's a lot of unknown about creativity. Uh, so yes, it's a, it's a very, very challenging subject. If we go back to ancient times, Greece, Rome, creativity or you know, the, the act of, of creation was actually linked to a divine intervention. They did not, the people did not think that it was for humans, that some sort of a spirit came to humans to somehow magically insert creative ideas. So, of course, it was linked, again, to gods, to a divine entity. And the Romans had a term for that spirit, and that term was the word genius. The genius was that spirit that inserted creativity into human beings. It goes without saying, we all know that that term, genius, has been used throughout history quite a lot up to these days. And I happen to have many heroes from, very, from various diffi different fields, which I call genius. David Bowie, Jorge Luis Borges, I'm from Argentina, <laughs> Glenn Good, Le Corbusier, yes, Maradona, <laughs> Mark Rothko, the great Louis Kahn, John Lennon, Coppola and Brando, Bob Dylan, Steve Jobs, Roger Feather. And on purpose, I'm ending with Brian Eno, who, yes, it's a, one of my heroes. And uh, in case you don't know, he's a musician, he's a producer, he's an artist, amongst many, many other things. And a few years ago, Brian Eno was describing this uh, uh, notion of uh, people being called geniuses. Uh, there is this idea throughout the history that certain people are recognized as, as geniuses. But the truth is that most of those geniuses from any field that you can choose from actually flourished from a scene, from a cultural scene that had lots of influences on the way these people basically created. So it's not just about one person, it's about a, a community or a group of people. So he created a word for that. So rather than calling, rather than the, the individual creative intelligence, he calls about the collective creative intelligence of a seniors. And I found that particularly interesting, and I think that can be applied to obviously any uh, profession, yeah, but especially for the design process that we architects, engineers, in the creative industries, we use. Norman, is this working, sir? Yeah. Norman, many, many years ago, in, uh, actually in the, in the 80s, uh, he produced a set of uh, sketches like this one to try to explain to a client how would the project be developed in terms of the team. One of those sketches was this one, the concept of the round table, the concept of everyone sitting together, having the same voice, the client, the structural engineer, the mechanical engineer, all of the different, obviously, engineers, plus any other people involved, stakeholders in the project, everyone with a voice, everyone together, to try to find the best solution for that project. Goes without saying that you can always see who the architect is because he's the one wearing the round glasses. <laughs> In a, it's interesting because that approach is actually, I mean, back then for sure, maybe now a bit less, but, but it's still an approach that is not very common to teach in architectural schools. And as a side story, when Norman was 
doing his master's degree in Yale, he was doing his final project and he wanted, uh, he was designing a tower and he wanted to have help, advice from an engineer. So he asks the dean of uh, Yale at that time, Paul Rudolph, to see if he could get the input from an engineer. Paul Rudolph was a strong believer in no collaboration. <laughs> he thought that, of course, the students needed to do everything by, by themselves. Well, finally, Norman got what he wanted. He got the advice of the engineer. And he produced a design of a tower, which for him was actually quite a revelation, that, that uh, uh, interaction with the engineer. And some people even say that that tower has a major influence on the HSBC tower that he many, many years later designed with rather than having a central core, the course on the side, and a free open plan. So, in a way, Norman took that uh, uh, experience that he had in Yale, and he took it, obviously, to his professional practices along the years. We're talking about a, a, a holistic approach to design, you know, a holistic approach uh, that he has been developing over, you know, roughly six decades of, uh, of professional work. Now, if you look at, for instance, this is an image of uh, Foster and Partners in London, and based on that, it's very, very common to see architects sitting down with a diverse range of specialists, yeah, from acousticians, structural engineers, mechanical engineers, etc., etc. And this is actually something that is growing and growing more every year. It's about interdisciplinary thinking. It's about coming together from different fields to try to reach the best possible solution. So I thought this was interesting, kind of like summaring this up. Malcolm Gladwell said creativity is rooted in difference, in the unexpected connections among the broadest variety of people and ideas, communities and worlds. Similar to the concept, of course, that Brian Eno was describing as a seniors, but even expanded maybe with even more. But it's not only that. And I'm kind of like stealing now from the topics of this symposium. The design process includes inspirations. We all have lots of inspirations that we basically drew from. Data collection, it's, it's something that is absolutely necessary, whether it is collecting the information from a client's brief or understanding how a certain building type was developed over the years so that you can challenge the way it's designed and design it better. Data collection is a huge part of the, de of the creative process. And materialization, which we're gonna, I think, listen later today. Of course, the design process is dictated by the choice of materials, the technologies, and how they come together. So all of that is part of the design process. I can start showing now some pictures of buildings, whether it is building with history, like the Reichstag in Berlin, or the British Museum in London. The reinvention of the airport, first with Stansted, taking it further in Beijing. The design of the first bridge in over a century in London, the Millennium Bridge. The beautiful Milo Bridge in the south of France which almost appears to be flying when you're crossing it. Again, the sustainable approach to towers, pioneering sustainable approach to towers that started in HSBC in Hong Kong, obviously got developed further into this, the Swiss Re Tower in London, the Gherkin uh, or the Hearst in New York. And more recently, taking even the sustainable approach even further in headquarters for companies like Apple, and this is a picture of the quite recently completed Apple Park. Now, these images are only showing a glimpse of a building. What they are not showing are all of the roots, all of the inspirations, everything that would be all of the collaboration with amongst different people, and especially the hard work that has been involved into getting to these designs. This one in particular it's very interesting. You look at this image and maybe some of you or most of you could think that this is a one-liner. It's a simple idea that ha somehow, almost as a divine intervention, was inserted into somebody, you know, it's a circle, 
and then it got built like that. Of course, what it's not shown is that it's, it went through not just that, but th you know, hundreds of iterations of designs in order to get to the right one. And those designs are explored deeply via models, via drawings, and then carefully analyzed to see which one is the best one, selecting you know, almost kind of like finalist ideas, yeah? again, through drawings, through models, and involving a large group of people. So this kind of design process, you know, what's behind the finished building is actually what interests us the most. Going back to Norman's sketches that he produced for that client back in the 80s, it is explaining how every option is considered jointly and in depth trying to find the right target. And believe me, it's hard work and we do that for every single project. So the foundation, which is based here in Madrid, and I'm not sure if you know much about it, so I'm going to explain a little bit, in a way has as, a, as one of its main aims to develop the notion of the design process, to develop the notion of what happens before that building is completed. So in order to do that, the foundation has three units. The first one, which I like to call the backbone of the foundation, is the archive. The archive unit is, and actually is, I, I would say, one of the first in history as an architect that can be able to combine all of the work, all of his work from student days up to now and the future in one space. And the archive holds, you know, drawings from maybe not all projects, but a large quantity of the projects uh, uh, in terms of, you know, original drawings, in construction drawings, from sketches to construction drawings, a vast range of, uh, of, uh, of material, models, etc. Those drawings, old ones, are restored, they are digitalized, and slowly they're being uploaded into an, uh, the internet so that students, you know, young generations of our architects, future generation of architects can always go back and check and understand the process behind the buildings. We also hold Norman Foster sketchbooks. Funnily enough, actually, we even have a sketchbook from when he was 13 years old. So I would say from 13 to this day and to the future, we roughly receive around five sketchbooks per month. So you can imagine the amount of work that it's done. And they look something like this. Yeah. So every page filled with sketches, sometimes conceptual, sometimes more detailed, about all of the projects that are being developed at the moment. Goes without saying that it's a source of inspiration as well. Models are a critical part of showing the design process and in the foundation we happen to have process models of buildings like the HSBC. And it's very interesting to see the development of that, of that design. You know, you are used to seeing the final one, but it's very interesting to trace back how that design happened. And many times, some of the ideas that are abandoned for different reasons, sometimes are even better than the final built building. And those ideas that are abandoned, many times get picked up and used in other buildings and taken it to another level. The second unit in the foundation is the education uh, unit, where the notion of the inter interdisciplinary uh, uh, thinking and collaboration between different fields is even expanded further. We have strong links to most of the top universities around the world, and we organize workshops roughly every two months on different subjects, on cities, on mobility, on robotics, and digital technologies, where 10 top scholars from around the world get together, sit down, listen to seminars from experts on different fields. Again, this is not just about design architecture, but it's absolutely every uh, field that you can imagine, depending on obviously on the, on, the, on the subject of the workshop. Get together, have a session, five very, very hard working five day sessions until reaching a concept design for something. Always, obviously, divided in groups, 
So again, it's, it's enhancing on the collaboration as an approach to the creative process. The third unit, which is the one I lead, it's called Architecture, Design and Technology. And what we do here, it's a different kind of project. It's not, commer it's not a commercial practice. This is about doing experimental projects, conceptual projects that are mainly aimed at a social and a humanitarian agenda. So we have a vast range of, of projects and I could spend actually a lot of time telling you about them and the design process behind them. I will just name a few. We're doing a research on new, tech, on new farming technologies in the UK. We are restoring an abandoned theater in Venice where we wanna obviously bring it back to life and, and, and uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great cultural project, but of course it involves some research in terms of the materials that are being used. We are doing an experimental geodesic dome in the south of France, which is based on a project that Norman and back Mr. Fuller did back in 1982, and it was abandoned after back Mr. Fuller's death in 1983. So he's picking up from where they left and trying to develop it further now. We're doing uh, a project in Mexico about community centers bringing connectivity to people that are in isolated regions in Mexico. And the idea behind the design, which actually involves a lot of technology, is also to get the people involved in the design and in the construction of these community centers. We are collaborating with artists. This is collaboration we're doing with Mark Quinn and it's a piece of art which is about refugees so the idea was to create to design a tent a shelter for this piece of art that could potentially become a new technology a new way of designing refugees tents we're designing a system of schools for Africa this time it's in Nigeria schools that could be easily built and expanded throughout the country. And we're also collaborating with the research leg of a very interesting uh, company that specializes in electrical batteries. Uh, they developed an electric monorail and together with us, we are exploring the possibilities of expanding the use of that monorail, bringing other benefits and not just a mobility one, benefits as inserting other uses, cleaning air, and eventually becoming something that is innovative. So the projects are located in, in many places around the world. We are actually quite new in this, but our intention, our focus, it's a global one. And it's a global one. It's not that I'm, I'm saying that we want to conquer the world. It's not about that. It's about understanding the global problems. And I would say that we can all agree that something that is happening at a, an amazing rate is how people are moving to cities. So the future is about global cities. Cities are fantastic, but they consume 70% of the energy and they actually produce emissions roughly in the same order of magnitude. So, of course, that's a problem. They also fantastic because they generate wealth. So, of course, that's, that's a big plus. But there's a problem, and it's that now one in eight people are living in what is called slums, informal settlements. And this trend continuing on in 2050, it would actually be one in three living in slums. That is something that, of course, is very worrying, and it's something that we would like to try to change, to help in changing. To do that, we were, in a way, kind of lucky. I'm going to tell the story of a particular project, which is in India, in the province of, Odi of Odisha. India has over 100 million people living in slums. The project that, that uh, uh, I'm going to talk about is, is, uh, is in Odisha, uh, and Odisha has 10.1 million people living in slums. 
And up until quite recently, what the government was doing to deal with these situations. This is a slum close to the capital of, uh, of Odisha, Bhubaneswar. This is how that slum looks. And what the government has been doing is basically bulldozing and building these type of, of, uh, of uh, residential blocks. You can imagine that you know, there's nothing more alien to the communities there than this sort of construction. So people don't want to move there. Most of them actually remain empty, or the ones that are used are actually used in such a different way that what they need, that they basically don't function. So it's a, it's a very, very big problem. I said before we were lucky. We were lucky because through Ratan Tata, who leads the Tata Trusts in India, we got to be part of this project, which is called Odisha Livable Habitat Mission, which is a project that has been developed by the chief minister of Odisha, you can see here in the, in the picture. And this, this uh, livable habitat mission started out first with giving land rights to the slum dwellers, which is, a, of course, a very important first step. But with just doing that, it's not enough. So we now are involved, of course, with a larger group of people in trying to do more. The mission will give land rights to 11.7 of Odisha slum population. Roughly, we're talking about 2,200 slums, approximately 260,000 households, 1.2 million people. So we went there. This was approximately a year ago. We went there to visit some of these slums, having a first meeting with the community. And then when we came back to Madrid, and before starting doing any design, we thought, why don't we put, start putting together a questionnaire for the community, in a way building a brief, in a similar way to what we would do with any other client. So we sent out a set of questions that we carefully, obviously, produced. And some of the things that we got back from the community were things like this. What changes could improve your life? Number one, a concrete house. Very interesting, obviously, for this <laughs> symposium. I think by concrete, we think by concrete, they don't necessarily mean concrete, but of course, a very sturdy uh, house that can withstand uh, uh, cyclones. That, of course, I'm going to talk about that later. But it's interesting. The first thing is about shelter. It's about a strong house. Then a better school, education. Third one, a loan to start a business, work. We also send questions like this. What three services most urgently need improvement in your community? Number one, water. Number two, toilets. Number three, sewerage. So very interesting. We're getting, you know, by, by listening to them, we're getting the order of importance of the things that are needed there. What are the top three most urgent improvements that your home needs? Roof, number one. Walls, number two. So, of course, these are just a few of, of hundreds of questions that we analyze very, very carefully here not just ourselves, but with other people involved. And then the next step was to go there. Yeah. This is the first uh, uh, community that we are working on. It's called Nolia Sahi. As you can see, it's a coast. It's very close to a city, but it's a coastal uh, community. It's a fisherman's village. So the next thing was to go there and start doing participatory workshops with the community. So we sat down with the business owners, we had plans, obviously, of the, of the settlement. We sat down with the business owners. We sat down with the fishermen. And from those sessions came things like this. The fishermen and the business owners highlighted the importance of the main street, where most businesses are, highlighted, obviously, the importance of the beachfront, which is where their prim prim primary source of income comes. Then we sat down with the men. And it's very, very interesting. I mean, the men highlighted some things that were similar, but others that were very different. And there was this very interesting diagonal route that we are now rebranding the spine uh, that, for the men, was extremely important. It's a diagonal route that is joining two areas of the settlement, one which is probably the most public space next to the cyclone shelter and where most of the social activities happen in the town. And, and the, the kind of like 
side of uh, uh, closer to the entrance of the village. Lastly, we sat down with the women. Similar exercise with the women, again, some similarities, but you can see how the women highlighted the importance of a very defined grid. Yeah, streets that we can call regular streets. Of course, these streets are not for cars. The women did not mean that they want to turn these into, let's say, a normal car-driven uh, uh, city. These streets are to allow access, emergency access, for instance, to every household. Right now, as you can probably understand, an informal settlement, the word informal, obviously, makes it that it's growing in a very uh, a chaotic way, even though, of course, it's not really like that. Uh, but what, what, what happens is that many of the households are not possible to access to. So by the introduction, by careful introduction of some of these streets, that can be achieved. And the women highlighted that. So with all of the, this information, we came back. And again, this is not done on our own. This is not architects. This is a set of, of it's a larger group of people involving urban planners as well and other specialists. And we, all of that with the questionnaire, with the participatory workshops uh, uh, that we did, we kind of had the design. This design was developed together with the community. I'm not going to say it was easy, but I have to say that the vast majority of the ideas actually came from them. What we needed to do was to do it in a way that actually works. So we produced a master plan, and that master plan was tested you know, through actually other technologies to see if it works. And then we went back and presented it to the community and it was widely accepted. Please, please notice that always first row are the women, <laughs> which is probably a very, very important aspect of the community. So, of course, these people are very used to having uh, uh, other people coming, talking about doing things and not doing anything. And we were very worried with that. And these projects are difficult and they take a lot of time. But right after that presentation that you see here on the screen, we decided, let's do something about it. Let's start. So you can see us here, me, the team, you know, we started cutting bamboo and starting putting, as you can see here, somehow starting to define that grid that the women very intelligently asked for so that they started getting used to what the new master plan would be in the future. And the community obviously was doing everything with us, following us everywhere and helping us doing that. So that was the first step. This happened actually quite recently. Now, in a way, you know, I chose this project because I thought it was a fantastic way of explaining a creative design process in a very, in a way, you know, with something which is very different to what we normally do. And I think it's perfect. It's a perfect summary of what a creative process is. And I could stop the presentation here, but I want to talk a little bit more because I think now there's, some, there's a new development that happened in this project you know, very recently, and I think it could be interesting to discuss it with you because, of course, it has a, a, a very major engineering problem. I mentioned earlier that Noli Asahi, this uh, uh, settlement, is prone to cyclones, uh, winds up to 215 kilometers per hour, and this has, of course, you know, devastating effects. This is a picture uh, before the last cyclone that happened in uh, May and June, and you can see here, this, this is actually, this used to be a school. You can see how things get you know, pretty much destroyed after a cyclone. So that's a, a massive problem. And of course, now I can start talking about every new structure that we are developing together with them to try to improve this condition and for those things not to happen. But I want to focus on one in particular, which is very important for them. And it's related to the beachfront, which is where they, of course, their main uh, uh, source of income, fishing. This is how that beach looks now. 
Unfortunately, it's actually uh, filled with garbage as well. It's a dumpster, so the first thing that they need to do is to clean it. But they do lots of activities that are related to fishing. Of course, they need to store you know, the, the, the boats when they are not in use. They, need, they, they use it to dry fish. They use it to mend the nets, the fishing nets. And together with them, we started developing a structure that could help, a flexible structure that could help for them to host a variety of activities, fishing activities, market activities, etc., etc. So we looked at some of the things that they do. And this is, this is a structure, a very simple structure, of course, that they build during a festival that happens every year there on the beach. And kind of like based on that, we started developing using a similar range of materials, like the bamboo, the thatch, the sand, obviously, and maybe introducing some new techniques that we can discuss, actually, maybe later. We could produce a very, very simple structure that could have a stronger foundation, bamboo, uh, uh, that then can be turned into uh, a sort of uh, uh, space that can be easily expanded and very flexible inside, but of course very strong in its shape to withstand the strong winds. So we thought about this structure quite a lot. We thought about the idea of introducing new materials, whether it is a new type of concrete that could be applied in the surface at the top to make it stronger, or any other that we can think of, and making, and making it as a stronger uh, uh, structure. We went there, we presented all of this, obviously, to them. This design was developed with them, but we went back with our drawings, our models, and everything. It was very interesting that a carpenter there in the village took the drawings and came back with a model. Beautiful model, beautiful scale model that we have, actually, in our foundation here in Madrid. He built it, of course, with the material that was available there, the bamboo. And it was fantastic. On the one hand, we were very happy to see the design working. But on the other hand, he also explained to us the problems that he has, that he had building the, 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 the model, and also the potential problems that would appear if we were to build this in a larger scale. And that is that the bamboo that is available in that region is very, very hard. So it's difficult to bend. So these sort of curved structures are not something that would be easy to do there. Point number one is that. Point number two is that he thought that maybe they also felt a bit uncomfortable building these sort of structures because usually when they use bamboo, they use it in a straight, linear way. So of course, this happened literally very, very recently. Yeah? So we came back and started thinking about other alternatives. And Norman usually likes to, to say that sometimes to look into the future, you need to look way back into the past. Okay, maybe this is not way back, but it's 2003. And in parallel, we were doing a kind of like historic uh, uh, research on this settlement. And in this picture of 2003, you can see some structures appearing there on the beach. And if you zoom in, apologies for the quality, you see them closer, these triangulated shapes, they are appearing on the beach. Okay, it turns out that these structures were these. <laughs> An amazing uh, shelter that they use, that they build themselves. And where does this come from? It's actually the sails of the boats. So what they use basically to fish, the boat that they used to fish with the sail then was used as a shelter on the beach to be able to do the other activities like net mending, like drying fish, etc., etc. We thought it was fantastic and we wonder why was it that they stopped doing this? For now, the main reason that we found is that mostly they stopped using sails. Now they have motorboats. So therefore, there's only very, very few people that are using sails, and they're not doing this anymore. They stopped quite a few years ago, actually. And we wonder, I mean, and again, sorry I'm repeating myself, but this is something that we've been developing over the last week, 10 days. So with this information, 
we started saying, and very, very, this, this is what I call the very rough conceptual, you know, first attempt at, as a, uh, at a structure. You know, if we, if we take that as a base, this hyperbolic paraboloid uh, structure that they do as a base, that looks like that on plan, and we, in a way, create a module of that, that turns into four together, creating a larger space that can look like that, and then can obviously be replicated, expanded by them in a very, very simple way. It could look like this on the beach. This was done last night, yeah? <laughs> and this is a video that Norman shows very often. This is another slum. This is a slum which is in the middle of a city, in a very dense area, and they lack public space. So there's a train track that runs across it, and look what they do right when the train passes. You can see how people deploy these structures, yeah, these foldable structures, and turn it into a market. So we thought, would it be great if these structures that are based on their designs could be actually easily folded, taken away? And I forgot to mention something very important, that the other thing that we discussed when we were there was that they actually preferred a structure that is not permanent. Rather than trying to fight the cyclone, the strong winds from the cyclone, they actually prefer, at least on the beach, not on the houses, obviously, to have something that could be easily deployable. So again, super quick, you know, could we have a structure that you can fold down and start lifting it up into a tipi shape, then the basic structure to then apply the fabric and have a, a, a beautiful hyperbolic paraboloid module. And we started obviously working out with the team in the foundation how to do this with the techniques that they use and also introducing some new things. You know, we want to try to see if with some hinges and things, and we're usually, we are actually testing spare parts of cars that we can introduce to see how they can fold in a very simple way, effective way, cost-effective way, obviously. So this is from a few days ago, and here we are with Norman reviewing it, which was fantastic. This, uh, again, this was less than a week ago. And I thought this was very interesting to show you the design process of a, of a project that is very complex in a way, but what we want to do is to always try to achieve a simple thing, a simple thing that can be done by everyone and then can be taken as an idea and replicated. So going back to, in a way, the beginning, this is one of the rare pictures of Norman that you don't see him drawing. This is in the foundation, in the pavilion that we happen to call the Pavilion of Inspirations. So if Earlier, I spoke about the archive being the backbone of the foundation. In a way, the pavilion is the brain. It's the brain where the creative uh, process begins. I think some of you will come to the foundation tomorrow, so I will be happy to show them around. Uh, but the truth is that you know, this is very inspiring, but I think it was Picasso who said, when inspiration comes, it better finds me working. And that's something that Norman does all the time. Having lunch, in a helicopter, on holidays. There's no such thing as holidays, by the way. So I think that is an important message to leave. Creative process, it's a very hard, long, and involves a lot of people and a lot of work, lots of hours. Thank you very much.